afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to welcome all of you here today to our official launch of our Center for Leadership Studies Distinguished Speaker Series. Thank you to all of our attendees here today, particularly our St. Peter students and alumni, faculty and administrators, our colleagues from career engagement. I would like to offer a special welcome to our distinguished guests and good friends and partners from Seton Hall University who are sitting up front. And Seton Hall has really done an outstanding job at developing a leadership program in their School of Business and University, which has partially inspired our Center for Leadership Studies. Today is a very special day, marking the first of our Distinguished Speaker Series lectures. This series is designed to bring to St. Peter's leaders from business, the military, law enforcement, sports, healthcare, and many other professions. The center will also provide a vehicle for research and thought leadership. It will serve as living proof of the School of Business's commitment to developing learners to excel intellectually, serve compassionately, and lead ethically in alignment with our Jesuit mission. We are so honored and pleased to have such a distinguished leader with us here today. Professor Ray Butkus, our center's founding director, will be introducing him shortly. For all the students here, my guidance to you is listen, learn, and take heed. For first and second year students, we encourage you to consider applying to our Leadership Fellows Program. Please see Professor Butkus for more information about this. And without further ado, I welcome Ray to the podium to introduce our distinguished leader and speaker today. Thank you, Dean Natus, and uh, let me add my words of welcome to those that have just been expressed by uh, our Dean of the Business School. It's, uh, it's a delight to see you all here, particularly my leadership students, and I see some not only current leadership students, but former leadership students. So if you're currently a leadership student of mine, or have been in previous semesters, how about standing up? Yeah! yeah. Thank you. Four years ago, uh, the Center for Leadership Studies was first conceived. And following that conception, I drafted a white paper outlining the construct of this program. Now, one of the first people that I sent the draft of that document to was our guest speaker. He responded rapidly, and he gave very important guidance and input to that document. And so in a real sense, the center that exists today, that you've just heard Dean Natus describe, exists in part due to his uh, thought and guidance. And as we were considering who the kickoff speaker for this event would be, I could think of no one better than that individual. And he brings to the podium a wealth of leadership experience in the military, <coughs> in business, and in academia. He graduated from Norwich University and was commissioned an officer in the United States Army Corps of Engineers. He later earned a master's degree from the University of, uh, sorry, of Florida Tech uh, with a degree in industrial and organizational leadership. Now his particular branch of the Army, combat engineers, pride themselves on being the first to enter the battlefield and the last to leave it. It's a job that requires superb technical skills and excellent warfighting abilities. And it demands excellent leadership. Over the next 24 years following his graduation, he practiced that leadership daily. He held a variety of command and staff positions all with increasing levels of scope and responsibility uh, over the next 24 years. Now, two are of particular note to us today. He served as an assistant professor of military science um, at Florida Tech, 1990 to 1994, where he taught leadership skills 
to aspiring uh, young Army officers. And then his final posting in the Army was as professor of military science at Providence College, Providence, Rhode Island, where during his tenure and under his leadership, that program produced some of the most distinguished young officers of the United States Army. I guess the possible exception would be that small school on the banks of the Hudson, uh, about 60 miles from here. We've got a couple of alums from that school, but we won't talk about that school. Following his retirement from the Army in 2005, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, as Lieutenant Colonel, he served as Director of Operations at King Industries. It's a manufacturer of specialty chemicals for the lubricant, coatings, and electronics industry. And he, there, he worked in a variety of uh, positions associated with leadership issues and process improvement. In 2010, he joined the faculty of Northeastern University in Boston as professor of engineering leadership in the Gordon Engineering Leadership Program. He has developed and runs an intensive experiential leadership curriculum uh, for engineering graduate students. He is a soldier, an executive, an educator, a leader, a gentleman, and a good friend. Let's make welcome Steve McGonagall. Can, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Just, can you thank Ray for that intro? I've never had an intro like that. <laughs> Hey, I feel like I'm in pretty elite company because in 2005, I watched and was in the audience as Ray uh, did, did a similar intro for a guy by the name of Colin Powell. Maybe you've heard of him. Uh, but but uh, yeah, so I feel like I'm in pretty elite company right now. Um, can I love with you guys? We, we, we can talk, right? So here's the thing. So, so some of that was true. Most of it, the Army stuff was true. Here's the deal. I've just been assigned as a new leadership professor at Northeastern University in the Gordon Engineering Leadership Program, and I don't know what I'm going to do yet. So I call my friend Ray, and I'm all excited, and I say, Ray, look, I'm going to be a leadership professor. He's like, Steve, I am a leadership professor. I, I direct a leadership program at St. Peter's. I said, well, help me out. He said, well, you've got to talk to my students. My students are the ones who are learning all about leadership. If you come down, meet with us. My students can tell you what leadership is, and we can have a dialogue on that. And you, so you got, I need you guys to set me up for success. That's what's going on, here, right? So Rob and I, Rob, how long have we been doing this? Uh, a couple years now. A couple years now. So Rob and I have been doing this a couple. You want to talk today, or should I? All right, I'll talk today. <laughs> okay. So Rob and I have been doing this for a while right now. So here, so here's what I'd like to do. If this is all right with you, um, what I would like to do is I would like you to give me an indication of what leadership is. So I'm going to ask you to tell me, we'll get there in a minute, what leadership is, right? And we need to have an interactive dialogue to do that. To have to, so, so though I haven't started really teaching yet, there's one thing I've decided, and it is this. I have never given a lecture, and I'm not going to start today. That's going to be one of my maxims. I've never given a lecture, I'm not going to start today. So we need to have an interactive dialogue. You guys do that? Stand up. Everybody, please start, put your stuff, stand up. Raise your right hand. Raise your right hand. Uh, I state your name. You solemnly swear that I am willing to have an interactive dialogue on leadership with you today. Thank you. Take your seat. Okay. Um, so, so we're going to have a dialogue, and, and then we're going to get to the point where I'm going to ask you some questions. And you're actually going to have a dialogue with each other about, about some of these questions, right? And then we're going to circle back and we're going to see if we can come up with a couple of definitions that I think are key to what we're trying to do today, right? And that is to de define what leaders do and what leadership is, right? So, okay, so let me ask you this. What do good leaders do? Okay, wait, wait, wait. That took way too long. And we don't raise hands. I know we do, in class you raise hands with me, you know. What do good leaders do? Inspire. Inspire. Rob, inspire. Okay, hang on now, hang on. I, I want to talk about inspire a little bit. What do you mean when you say inspire? inspire How do you do it? You do it by uh, acting as an example. 
Okay, so I've heard two things now. I've heard inspire and lead by example. Cap capture. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, my spelling's worse than Rob's. That's why he's writing. So spelling doesn't count because we're going to go fast and furious. Young man. Motivate. Young. Okay, leaders motivate. Yeah. All right. So what does what does motivate mean? How do you motivate? How, how does your coach? What's your sport? How does your coach motivate you? He's got his own style, doesn't he? Okay, so, so, think, so think about that, because I want to come back to that. So leaders inspire, they motivate. What else they do, please? They educate you. Okay, leaders educate you. So, so flesh that out a little bit more. So they teach you like new things every day, um, they kind of guide you. Okay, so, they, so I heard educate, I heard teach, and I heard coach, or I said coach, right? So how about we say teach, coach, and one, one more, teach, coach, and? Guide, okay, teach, coach, guide, and add mentor to that. Leaders got a mentor, right? Because here's the thing. If you don't do a program like the program that many of you are in right now where you can study leadership, the best way we learn leadership is by observing the model leadership behaviors of someone who's good at it, right? And if you've not had the opportunity to really observe someone wherever you are, you might not know what good leadership's about. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta see it. And the way we teach leadership is by modeling leadership to the people that are around us. Those above us, believe it or not, those at our level and those below us. We model these behaviors, right? Okay, what else? What else do good leaders do? Throw it out. They influence people. Influence, I love it, right at the time. Leaders influence, what does that mean? Uh, when they have like um, power over the support of that's my favorite leadership word. Influence. We're going to circle that one. So leaders influence. Thank you, Rob. Go ahead. I, I cut, you, cut you off mid-sentence. Uh, they have power over this board and influence them to do what they want, but in a good way. Okay. That, that's really key because ultimately, right, that's what leaders are trying to do, right? They're trying to influence their people. They're trying to influence behaviors. They're trying to influence outcomes, right? I teach largely engineers, and they have to get a product or a project done to spec on time under budget, right? And that's not going to happen unless they influence that outcome. So influence is huge. Thank you. Just um, throw it out here and then here. They take action, they observe, and reflect. Okay, so take action, <coughs> observe, and re re reflect. Okay, take action, observe, and I think that all goes down at one. You thinking of something in particular you want to share? Uh, I want to say more like in a project, they have to observe what's what they can do, take action, or reflect at the same time. Okay, really good. So you're talking uh, about a phrase that we call situational awareness, right? And situational awareness, how, how might we define situational awareness? Anyone feel they've dialed in on that? What is situation? Rob's got it. Go ahead, Rob. It's more like you look at your environment and you're able to tell like, what's going on. So like in a battlefield, for example, when you're like on patrol, you're kind of like looking at your surrounding areas to like, see if you're being suspicious. If there's like some dirt on the road that shouldn't be there, it's probably explosive. So you always have to have situational awareness, not just like in the military, but also in the business world by looking at different trends that go on in the market. Really good. So situation awareness beyond the battlefield is knowing everything that's going on, right? Who in your team is getting along with someone else? How close are you to your goal? What do you have to deconflict? Who needs to be motivated? Who needs to be influenced? Who needs to be coached or mentored, right? This all comes under situation, situational leadership. So, okay, we got a good list going, please. Organize. All right, so good leaders organize. Let's, let's write organize down. And, and how about an exclamation point after organize? Because I want to I circle back to that. What does that mean in your mind? So, leaders are organized in the sense where they manage their time. They use their time wisely, also the times of others. And they also, they also have structured goals. Okay. Their goals of what they want to achieve. Okay, all right. So, uh, a, Group with that, please. Organize. What else would you say? Uh, manage their time? Yes. Organize their time? Yeah. Put those together because I want to put those almost in a, in a unique category. Please. They empower you. Ah, oh, great. Empower. So who's your leader that empowers you? Um, personally, I look up to Jordan Peterson. Okay. And Jordan's probably awesome, I yeah, bet. Yes. Okay. So what does empower mean to you? Um, they understand um, what you're good at good at and they set you up on the path for success. 
Okay, so they, so they figure out what your skills are, they work to your skills, and they empower you and set you up for success. Absolutely. You guys are, you guys are very dialed in. This is, going, this is great. Go ahead. Uh, leaders have to communicate and direct. Okay, so that's, are they the same? Are they related? So you said two things, communicate and direct. How do we want to reflect on that? The best way to direct is to communicate effectively. So I think all these things that we have on the list here wouldn't be possible without the, you know, the right words. Okay, communication. so communication is absolutely key. So we'll put communicate. And, and I really like the word direct too. And some, so direct is, a, direct is a word that not everybody likes, right? Direct is a word that not everybody likes. It can sound too almost coercive. But a good leader, when she is directing, she is not coercing. She's, she's leading by example, right? So, excellent. Please. They are a visionary. Ah, oh, okay. So they are a visionary. So, uh, Rob, we're really going to capture this one because this is a key leader task. So, leaders are a visionary and they, and they provide what? They provide clear goals that are structured. In accordance with the vision, right? So leaders provide a vision and to do so they need to be visionary. Yes. Absolutely key that a leader provides a vision, right? What, and obviously the reason why is, why are we getting out of bed in the morning? Has my leader been able to provide a vision that sets my soul on fire to want to accomplish this task? Or am I just, is it vague? Is it ambiguous? It doesn't really mean anything to me, right? So the vision is so key as in, in, in regard to what a leader does. So great point. Great, great point. Please just throw it out. Compassionate. All right, so leaders are compassionate. So what are, so what are you saying by the, being compassionate? So they seek to value their support and time, and also their skills. Okay, so there's a lot going on there. Being compassionate and being respectful of their time, right, and working through their skills. There's a lot going on there. Do you want to, shall we categorize that as compassionate for now? Okay, compassionate for now. Maybe we'll dial in a little bit further on that. Please, just throw it out. A uh, good leader makes their support and skill value. All right, a good leader makes their subordinates feel valued. How many, so first of all, I, I told you direct was a hard word. How about subordinates? Are you guys okay with that word? Everybody okay with that word? Because some, some circles aren't, right? Some circles aren't. So a leader makes their subordinates feel valued. And what's a couple ways a leader can do that? So giving credit where credit is due, um, making somebody feel like their skills are really contributing to whatever the project is, whatever the vision is. Good for you. Let me tell you what, you guys are taking the right class right now. <laughs> you, guys are, you guys are in a good place right now. I love it. Please. Um, a balance between following and leading. Ah, follow, a balance between following. So a good leader, are you, flesh that out for me a little bit. Like, for example, they have to have like, the ability to listen to their followers. Okay, so a good leader has to follow and, and listen as well, right? Yeah. So regardless of your position, whether you're brand new to the company, whether you're a mid-level manager, or whether you're the CEO, or whether you're on the board of directors, you're going to report to somebody, right? And so, what, even if we're a leader, we are also a follower. Followership is an absolute key essential to being a good leader. Understanding what it means to follow, and being a good follower. Please. Leaders are also trustworthy. Trustworthy, I like that. So what, uh, what do you mean by that? Um, they're able to like, apologize. Okay. Um, so I'm hearing a kind of a kindness, a kind of a kindness bent there. Okay. So should so we add that as well? Accountable. Okay. Good. Please, ma'am. Uh, a good leader has integrity. I love it. Uh, you know, does what does what he or she says, says what he or she. Okay. Excellent. So so good leader has integrity. Does what he told. Please. An effective listener. A good leader is an effective listener. Why is that important? You need to be able to evaluate what you're hearing without making a quick judgment. Okay. Uh, so we have to be able to analyze a little bit, interpret a little bit, and it takes listening. It might take some patience. Where's the, is there a balance between how long we listen and when we make a decision? Let me ask it this way. Who has been under a leader, a team captain, a coach, who has been what we would call indecisive? Okay, so I see a lot of hands going up. How does that feel? Right? The paralysis of analysis. So a good leader does need to listen, but another thing a good leader needs to do is know when it's time to make a decision. And you're not going to have 100% of the information. You might not even have 80. But you're going to go with your gut and your experience and what your people have told you, right? And so a good leader is going to be decisive. Add that one. Well, you're getting a lot over there, Rob. Good, good, good job. All right, please. Emotionally intelligent. 
Okay, so E I. E I, right? E Q is the other one, right? Mm -hmm. So what are we talking about there? Being able to even in anger and certain types of problems they can uh, sustain it and portray a, a good quality of character. Okay, a a absolutely. Totally totally agree with that. Totally agree with that. Please. Uh, the good leader has courage and is able to make decisions under pressure. Okay, so, so I talked about the decision piece and we're talking about adding decisions under pressure. That's the hardest time, right? Yeah. Okay, excellent. In the back. And they have to be able to sacrifice. Oh, leaders, okay, so leaders sacrifice. What does that mean? So, in order to do all of that that's written down, you have yeah. to be able to sacrifice your time, your passions to... Okay, so a leader sacrificing but still leading, is there a, is there a name for that type of leadership? I heard it. Servant. Servant leadership, right? Servant leadership. What does that mean? I can tell you what it means to me. I want to know from you. What does servant leadership mean? Anyone? Please. Having the growth mindset for others. A growth mindset for others is a part of it. I want to see if we can really boil this down. Servant leadership. I know this, I know this is a key focus for you guys. Bring out the best in uh, subordinates by... Uh... We have the best in subordinates by empowering them. By, okay, so it, best in some, so some of that we've captured already, but that's a big part of servant leadership. Here's, here's my thoughts on servant leadership. Just uh, boil it down to the simplest element. If you work for me, that means that I work for you. It's that simple. If you work for me, I might direct you. I might try to motivate you. I might try to influence you. But my real job is to give you the vision, empower you, and get out of your way. And if there's an obstacle is in your way, my job is to crush it. If there's a resource that you don't have, that you need, my job is to get you that resource. If, and think about this, because you're going to be leaders out there. If someone works for you, you work for that person. That's your job as a leader, is to serve that person and make sure their needs are met. All right, we've got a really good list going. Um, please. Be consistent. Isn't that a huge thing? Thank you. Capture that one, Rob, please. Consistent. We want consistency, right? We want to know that if this general thing happens, this general thing is going to be the leader's response. It's not going to be some outrageous, off the handle, different. We want consistency out of our leaders. That, that, that's an excellent point. I got on the right, please. Adopt. What does that mean, adopt? Puppies? Kids? Oh, adapts. My bad. Yeah, okay, I, I can totally relate to that. I've been a leader of a lot of organizations all across a long period of time. Never once have I been the smartest person on the team, the smartest person in the room, the smartest person in the organization. I need to, I need to listen and I need to adapt to what other people are saying. Okay, so adapt. So we got a pretty good list. Is this, is this it? No. Okay. Good planning skills. Okay, so planning skills. A good leader has good planning skills. Leader has to be able to plan. Or if the leader doesn't have good planning skills, because I, quite frankly, don't. I do. I guess what I do when I need to. What else does a leader need then? If they don't have personally good planning skills, someone who has them. Hey, boss. That's what we need to do, right? Hey, boss. Oh, you know, right? Excellent. Please. Like you said, I'm just adding on to it, but you said that like you, somebody works for you, and you also work for them, so you should also, as a leader, be Okay, absolutely. So we've, we've got listening up there, we've got be open, and we've got adapt. So have, have, is that one covered adequately, or would you like to add something to it? We're good to go there. Okay, please. Uh, a good leader also takes risks. Okay, Passes. okay. All right, so takes, takes risks. Okay, so, so hang on, this is something. So I like this list, right? And so I have really limited RAM. I got like two megs of RAM. So <laughs> is this... Is this enough? Like, if I go to Northeastern with this list, and can you take my picture, Ray? Because if I just do these things, right? If I just do these things right here, do I have it covered? Obviously, the answer is no. There's much more to leadership. So let me, this is where I want you to get a little bit interactive here, okay? And so I want to ask, I want to ask some questions of you. This is what we're going to do, please. Take, take whichever hand you prefer and just put, make a fist. Go like this. 
pull it up here. I'm going to ask you a question. And I just want a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Right? And I don't want you to look at your friend. I don't want you to look at Ray. I don't want you to look at the dean. I don't want you to look at the colonel. When I ask you a question, I, within a millisecond, I want a thumbs up or a thumbs down, yes or no. Fair? So you're either going to go like this or you're going to go like that. Good? Okay. Let me see. Where, sh where shall I? All right. How about this? True or false? As a leader, it is sometimes necessary to bend the truth. Up, down, up, down, up, 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 more ups than downs. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, I don't have consensus on this, and so now I want, it, I want you to hear from each other. Someone who had their thumb up, tell me why. This takes guts now. Who, who's going to speak? Hang on, Rob. Let's give them a second. I, they, they raised their hand. They said they would participate. Please. It depends on the situation. Ah, situationally dependent. So yeah. let's hear it. So like if you're in, in a, you know, something that's very critical like banking or something, maybe stretching the truth will get you with legal repercussions. But if it's something that's like trivial and, you know, your followers are just doing a small task, maybe bending the truth might help them work harder or faster and will not confuse or complicate them. Okay, so I, how many other people agree with that? I think that makes good sense. Yeah, it's really due on Friday, but if I tell my team it's due on Wednesday, uh, I'm more likely, right? Because you've all lived this, right? You've all lived this. What? We tuned it in on Wednesday, what, right? Okay, so um, did that convince those of you that had your thumbs down to, to change it to up? <coughs> okay, so no. So some of you that had your thumbs down, I, I'd like to hear from someone. Why is it not necessary occasionally to bend the truth? I feel like bending the truth will, like, it, it goes with your character, so I feel like your subordinates will question, like, like your sense of, um, like you're not trustworthy anymore. Because if you can bend the truth about something small, then you can bend the truth about something big, because it might not be big to you, but it can be big to somebody else. But I feel as though, like, certain people don't, they can't handle the truth. So I feel like leaving it out is not bending the truth. It's just in that situation, oh, okay, okay, they can't handle okay. it. So right now. now. So now we're talking about not necessarily bending the truth, but omitting a portion of the truth. And that's okay? For now. For now, okay. Well, no, 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 please. Don't, I don't want any hand raising. I want you to talk to the person that just talked. You guys are going to have a dialogue and work this out. Go ahead, please. That's um, considered deception. And we talked about integrity. And can you say you have integrity if you're deceiving people and admitting the truth and lying? Those are two conflicting things. But I didn't say, like, they won't ever find out the truth. But right now, like, if we're in, like, a dire situation and we need to get the job done, and you know that person can't handle everything right now, like, letting them know everything at once, it, they might get overwhelmed and we won't get the job done. But at, when the task is complete and, okay, this is what X, Y, and Z, then I feel like that's different. Then they could also see, like, okay, she was looking after me, like, we, we had to get the job done, but, like, she knew, like, my strengths and weaknesses, so I couldn't, you know, like, I don't know. <laughs> Please, you don't have to raise your hand, just jump right in. I see where you're coming from, but also, you were talking about trustworthiness and stuff like that, and don't you think that it would kind of hurt your subordinate, thinking, like, oh, I didn't think you handled it, so I let you know little by little by little, then it would kind of take away their feeling of accomplishment at the end of the task, because... You as a leader didn't have faith in the person that you hired, the person that you said that they could do what they were doing. And then at the end of it, like, yeah, I did it, but like, they had to do it all. They had to break it down into baby pieces for me. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily, because your leader, it, your leader knows their, their subordinates. They know their strengths and weaknesses. So I feel like they knew, like, okay, you strive in this part, but we all have those strengths and weaknesses. So your weakness would not strive in this certain situation. So that's what is your name, please? Rochelle. Russia is oh, Rochelle. Rochelle is, is defending about half the people in this room right now who had their thumb in a certain direction but aren't, aren't willing to say anything. Who's going to help her out? Can I counter-argue? Um, yeah, sure. This is, what, this is what I want you to do is counter-argue. So you can either hurt people with lies or the truth. It's a question of whether you hurt people with deception or the truth. Just, just throw it in. I think that what you're also trying to get at too is there's a concept of management called information overload. If you communicate too much information, even if it's effective, if you over communicate, things are irrelevant to the people below you or people that you're working with, then you might, you're probably telling the truth about all of that, but you're now bamboozling somebody with too much information that's irrelevant to them. Again, that might be. 
Just throw it out. I'm yeah, so I, to kind of echo in that sort of way, there is, I definitely think, a, a need to know kind of information that comes with leadership. Okay. And there's a lot of things that you have to decide as a leader if that's ev something everyone should know. And I think in that kind of case, it is okay to leave things out because especially if you don't know if it's going to come to full fruition or if it's going to actually affect the organization or your okay. subordinates, that's a situation where maybe not telling the truth. So, so I think that we're back where we started with this gentleman. Your name, please? Uh, Jay Joseph. J jo Jay Joseph said situ situationally, <laughs> right? So, and I think we're, we've circled kind of back to that. So let me ask this. So we've had some really great dialogue on this topic. Um, do we, so I, I'm a consensus kind of person. So, do we have consensus right now that no, leaders won't bend the truth? Or do we have consensus that yes, leaders need to bend the truth? Okay, so I'm still seeing an equal number of people going like this and this for both questions. So let's just do this. Let's just do this. Bend the truth. And uh, we don't have consensus, so we're 0 for 1. Put them out. Put them out. <coughs> True or false, as a leader, we want to treat everyone the same. Quickly, 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 quickly. Up, down, up, 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 down, up. Oh, a lot of ups in the back. Okay, so we don't have agreement, and I want you to do the same thing you just did. Talk to each other. So different people require different treatment. Some people need to be yelled at. Some people need to be compassionately talked to. Some people um, need different motivations. So by treating everyone different, you fail to see, see the individual and how that person functions. Each person, you don't, you don't treat your um, mom the same way you treat your best friend. So why would you treat someone on your team similar to uh, another colleague? No, but if we're trying to empower everyone, I think everyone has to be treated equally the same. But, but not everybody has the same amount of, you know, empathy and motivation. I get it, but as a leader, you have to understand how to empower someone and how to talk to someone, and we all have to be treated the same, because that's why we're creating. There, there's that's some really good discussion going on. Someone over here needs to jump in. No, you don't need to raise your hand. You just need to yell over there. So I think there's a difference between equality and then there's equity. So you need to take different people's talents, different people's skills, stress levels, etc., into account as you're leading them. So if you treat everybody equally, like you know, the exact same, treating everybody the same, you're not taking everybody's different talents and skills into account, and you're not um, effectively using people's skills for the benefit of the project uh, or the vision, um, and you're not most effectively um, helping them to thrive in your organization or in your whatever group you're leading if you just treat them all the same. You have to treat them each according to their ability and what they're good at. It's not better or worse. You don't have to treat somebody better than somebody else. Right. You never, but you treat people according to the personality type they have and according to the accountabilities that they have. So if you're oriented to finance or if you're oriented in another, like if you're all in a company and you have different sections, then you're not all being treated equally to the same standard, but that doesn't mean you're being treated better or worse. You're still being equitable though. Yeah, just because the methodology of how you speak to somebody and how you get a message across is different doesn't mean the level of respect is different, and I think that's what we're focusing on. Okay, so, re so some really good conversation here about this uh, from, from all, everyone who's, who has spoken so far. Um, do, how about this? Any consensus here? Treat everyone the same? Right. Yes? Oh, no. So, some people still want to be heard, please. Sorry. No, not sorry. No, this is what we're doing here today. <laughs> this is why. This is why we're here. I think the main thing is not treat like we're treating like everyone differently. Let's just say that's how discrimination is actually evolved from. Like for example, if you have an unconscious stereotype of a particular sort of group, you're going to treat that group differently than the rest of the groups. But let's say if you're going to treat everyone equally, regardless of that subcon that subconscious stereotype. That okay, you're I, I can't disagree with that. I don't understand your argument. Are we? Are you saying that by treating people differently, our subconscious um, biases yeah, will like manifest? Yeah, for example, if you're, um, you have say different personality types, for example, like if you're saying like if there's like a man and a woman, you like say you're subconsciously saying that oh the man is more like like a stereotype more like intellectual than and the woman's more emotional. You're and it's saying that you're going to treat the person as the personality type. Like, for example, you treat the woman as if they're emotional mess, like, obviously, that would turn into discrimination. Okay, so I, I, I think you're making valid points. I'm not sure if it's completely uh, centric, but, but it is definitely peripheral to what I'm talking about. So let me just ask at this point. 
So treat the same. Do we have agreement? So I get thumbs up. Where's my thumbs down? I get, oh man, over two. Over two. Okay, so let's, let's just do, I'm probably asking the hard questions first. So let me ask some easier questions. All right? And, and maybe we can come to consensus. So get them out. <coughs> true, or false, true or false? As a leader, we generally want to avoid risk. Up, up, down, up, down, up, a lot of downs. A couple of ups. Okay, so all you ups back there, you take, take point on this. Why are we, go ahead, what were your thoughts? Avoiding risk. It depends on the situation. It's all situational. We've already agreed on that. But in, in the back, what, what, what are your thoughts? Go ahead, there was five or six of you. I think that risk is definitely something that needs to be calculated, but if you can avoid risk, why would you take it on? Like, obvious, like, it's just, it's only going to cause more problems in the long run. But not really because risk, risk in itself is not, it not, doesn't mean that it's going to be bad. Like how did Facebook start? All these uh, companies that started from nowhere, they took a risk. They decided that that was going to be what they were going to do. And now the platform that they have is so much bigger. So in reality, the risk was big, but it came out to be something greater. Hmm, okay, I can't, can't disagree with that. I feel like a risk can actually help you learn too. So like if you take a risk like that, you might have risks like those in the future. So you can actually learn from those. Wait, you had your thumbs down though, didn't you? Yeah, so I, I feel like you should learn, like, no, 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 I mean, I did it for risks, like, not avoiding risks. Okay. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. Okay. So I feel like risks, taking risks would actually help. Okay, all right, yeah. good good point. Throw it out, please. Hey. Yeah. Uh, sometimes risks lead to rewards, and sometimes you can learn from your risks. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, so I've, I'm hearing some really good, just throw it out. So, you're going to have to know when to take a risk. You're not going to go walk into Tiger's Den because that's, I mean, you just want to take a risk. But calculating um, the um, opportunity cost of the risk and if it's, be it's better than the situation you're in and making that conscious decision, that's worthy of taking a risk. Okay. That, that's a pretty good argument. I'm not going to the Tiger's Den. So what do you think about that one? Is that, was that an easy? So where are we on that one? Avoid risk? Everyone say yes, we want to avoid risk? Okay, so who, who says they still want to avoid risk? Seriously? No. Everybody? So, okay. We are one for three. All right. That's not bad. Oh, no. Okay, so th there's still some dissent. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let that go. Um, all right, let me see where I want to go from here. Let, let's just do this. Let me give you a scenario. And the first couple of things, all you have to do is kind of just agree with me. Or you can choose not to. It's up to you. You're a leader. And you're in your workspace, whether it's your office, whether wherever you lead from. You're a leader and you're in that space. You're going to behave in a certain fashion. All I really need you to do is go like this. Okay, right? Okay, so now you leave work and you drive home and now you're home and you're with your family. Are you going to be, uh, behave a little bit differently at home than you did as a leader in your office? Okay, so pretty much I'm seeing a lot of north-south. Okay, so still, okay, so now we've had dinner, and we've got a soccer game, and we're going to go out and have, uh, our, take our kids to soccer, and, or, or we're going to be out at a soccer practice. Are we going to behave a little differently on the soccer field with other people than we did at dinner, which we said was different from the office, yes or no? Yes. So still, I'm getting a lot of north-south, right? Yeah, we're going to behave a little bit differently there. And so now, let's say we're all adults, we're over 21, and so we got some beer, <laughs> And uh, so, so might, if, that, if it gets to be totally social, might we even behave a little differently then? Yes. Okay, so I'm still getting a lot of north-south. You wonder where I'm going with this. Here's where I'm going. So if yes, different from the office, yes, different at home, yes, different at the soccer field, yes, different once we introduce alcohol, let me extrapolate that all the way out to a phrase that you may or may not have ever heard before, which is this. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> Okay, this is an interesting one. So, happens in Vegas, stays in Vegas. Thumbs up or down? So I got up, I got down, I got, I got just as many ups as downs. So, so, so my ups, tell me why, why, why are we up? You, go ahead. Yeah, please. Yeah, you, had, you had a thumb up. Go ahead. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you said, yeah, definitely, that's good going. Uh, yeah, no, you know, actually, then I, I rationalize it a little bit more, and I disagree, so can I, can I give my... <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I um, wish you would. No matter what you do, if it's in public, um, 
you know, I mean, it goes like we were talking about this in my business ethics class that what you do on social media, should that affect um, your professional career? And I think ultimately it does because people are going to uh, look at you and look at your character um, and they're going to judge you based off of that. And if you're acting one way, um, that would reflect bad, badly on the company okay. outside of work, then that's going to wind up affecting you. But dude, you're in Vegas. No one's going to see you there. <laughs> <laughs> As long as it doesn't hurt anybody. So, okay, so I, that's a thumbs up. That, that's a, that's, does anybody else want to advocate for the thumbs up position, please? I don't want to advocate for it. Okay, so I'd like, still like to hear what you have to say. So I just don't think that's the type of world we're living in. People are pulling up things from your past, like 20 years ago, and they're, um, they're portraying you on the news. Um, in my opinion, I think everyone makes stupid mistakes, but if you're a virtuous person, you wouldn't have to worry about, hey, what, what happens in Vegas, Vegas stays in Vegas. Um, it wouldn't be a big deal, um, but it is. But sometimes when you're young and dumb, stuff like that just happens. It's, it's not like I'm there for it to happen. So if it's brought up again, like I, I've learned from my mistakes. So you see where I've grown to. So why is there a need to bring me back up? And you know that I wasn't really under. So, so this is a, the tradition of forgiveness you're talking about, right? Well, Thank goodness for that concept. <laughs> Like why 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 bring it up and it's not necessary anymore? Like you trying to diminish my character while I've already built myself up to where I don't want to look back at that. I I'm, I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe, please please jump in. You have the mic. You ready to rock? But funny funny enough, um, we've seen cases where in the news where things that happened a long time ago was just based on like me being reckless and me being influenced and being young. So. Saying that whatever happened in Vegas, stays in Vegas, is unnecessarily <clears throat> correct from myself, from my perspective, because you know whatever it is that you've done, Fresh it's necessarily mean, oh, it happened here, oh well, but move <laughs> out, it can happen now. That's so that. I feel like disregarding what you did um, blinds you from seeing that what you're doing is wrong, and um, just because it happened centuries ago doesn't mean that oh, we forget about it. But I, I see. Okay, it's so not, it's not that you're forgetting about it. It's just it's not relevant, you know. Oh, okay, so one one last point, then I'm gonna have to move on. It, it's not. We're, I think we took it to an extreme of what happens in Vegas into a negative because it's not. Is we also have to think about the ethical and the morale. It's like okay, I'm not gonna act the same as I act in my home in my in my job. I'm supposed to uh, behave a certain way in my job of being responsible, doing that, and in my, in my home I can get loose and be more myself. Okay, please, La last well, one. It all has to do with mindset, like, you're not going to do it when you're 15, something you say, that's not, you, you're going to grow up and you're going to learn from maturity when you're 25. So if you're in Vegas at 15, <laughs> <laughs> I got a problem with that. Right. Hang on, because guys, listen. This, this is a very, very rich dialogue, and we're talking about the most important components of leadership right now. And I hate to cut this off, but I'm going to because I, 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 I have to kind of dial us in here. Um, what's, a, what's another way I could have phrased bend the truth? What's another word for bending the truth? So, so okay, so flexible was yelled, but 17 people said lie at the same time, right? So I'm going to go with lie, right? So... Is bending the truth lying? It's a deception. Look, okay, so my point is, and it was brought up early on, whether or not you decide to bend the truth or not <coughs> is going to tell me that you either have or do not have personal what? Integrity. Integrity. Thank you. Write that one down. It's already been said once. Integrity. And if I were to ask you, true or false, as a leader, once in a while we need to lie, what would your answer be? Yeah. No. I hope. I hope it would be no, right? I hope it would be no because it's a slippery slope. Once you've told, if you told me the truth all the way along, now all of a sudden you tell me a lie, you're a different person. And I'm going to question everything that you've told me. And, and, and I just don't know where the truth is anymore. Once you lie, you've become a different person, right? So I'm asking whether or not an individual has integrity. When I say treat everyone the same, I know it's ambiguous. And you guys made great points about this. We're not going to treat everyone the same because people are different. Some need a hug. Some need a kick. Some need motivated in a different way, right? 
But what am I saying? Do we, we're going to treat everyone with equal what? Respect. Thank you. Respect. So respect, please, Ross. Integrity. Respect. Are you seeing a trend here? Yeah. All right. The next question was, are we going to avoid risk? And if we avoid risk as a society, we're going nowhere. Right. right? So we look at risk. We understand risk. We assess risk. We mitigate risk. We minimize risk, and then we take prudent risk, right? And to do that, an individual has to have personal awareness. Courage, courage right? And someone said that before. Let's add courage, please, Rob. Rob, you're, you know, it's because we've been doing this a while, but you've got a lot of right answers. Okay, Vegas. Vegas, what, what does that mean? What happens in Vegas, say, the commercials even say it. What does that mean? It means you can go to Vegas and you can compromise your what? Your integrity, your morals, your values, right? So, I mean, really? What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas? You're going to compromise your morals or your values because you're in a different place? So I would argue, I would hope that you would as well, no. You might behave a little differently on the soccer field, but you're not going to compromise your values, I'm hoping. You might behave a little, little differently in another scenario. But what I, what, so what do all these things that I've asked you about have in common? What are they? What are, so integrity, respect, courage, and let's, let's call Vegas honor, right? Honor. And I'm going to define honor as doing the right thing because it's right, even when no one's looking. Right? That's a hard one, isn't it? Doing the right thing, that's a hard one, right? Because it's right, even when no one's looking. What are these, what are these things? Rob, slide over a little bit. Thank you. Integrity, respect, personal courage, honor. Add loyalty to that. What are these? It, can we categorize them? They're values. They're values. Thank you. Who said that? I did. Check. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. No, oh, ma'am, I think. Ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, they're values, right? So what are values? What are values? Come on, because this is what I want to do right now, is I want to define what are values. Because I, I want to know if you guys know what they are. Do, do, you, do you know what values are? I would say they're what make you you. They're qualities that don't leave you, that, that, that carry you through challenge. That direct your steps in life. Okay, I agree with everything you said. A absolutely right. Values mean? are. Virtues. I'm sorry? Virtues. Virtues. Keep going. Keep going. Things that are important. Things that are important to you. Keep going. They are what we believe, right? So, val so, so let's start here. Bro and don't write on my, my wall, bro. Values, right? So, values are. Because I want you to understand this. This is where it starts. If you, want to, if you want to coerce me, you can do it. You can bribe me. You can do all kinds of things. But if you want to lead me, you want to really be my leader, I need to know what's in your heart. I need to know what's in your heart. And it starts with our values, right? So values are, go ahead, Rob, you can, you can work. What are values? We said beliefs. What kind of beliefs? Occasional beliefs? Shallow beliefs? Constant beliefs? Moral beliefs? Deeply held beliefs? Right? Personal beliefs. So, so let's say deeply held beliefs. Values are deeply held beliefs that do what? What do they do? What do our values do? They make us who we are. They do everything you guys are saying. They guide us. They make us who we are. We live them, right? Consistently. So deeply held beliefs that guide what? What do they guide for us? Behaviors. Behaviors. Deeply held beliefs that guide our behavior. They guide other things. What else? Actions. Actions. Perfect. What else? Decisions, right? They guide our decisions. They, and and they, are, they are generally in regard to something as either what or what? Right or wrong, good or bad, right? And, and this is where it starts. And this is the thing. You, you know, there's a lot of leadership in a lot of places, and, and, and we don't even consider that it starts with our values. And this is what I want you to contemplate today. This whole list that you gave me, it's beautiful stuff. And it is what leaders do. Leaders do all those things. But if you want to lead me, you better have integrity. And you better expect it from me. And you better, you better be a person who has the courage to tell me when I'm doing something wrong or someone else on the team. 
You better be someone who treats everyone with equal respect. From the president of the university to the person washing the windows when you come in in the morning, they should all be treated with equal respect because that's, that's, what, we, that's what we want as a society. That's what we want as a person. We just want to be treated with respect, right? We want to go out of our way to do that. And so what, this is what I want you to contemplate because I'm, I'm getting down to the wire here. You don't get to lead because you're the smartest. You don't get to lead because you're tall and beautiful or smart and handsome or intellectually or, or from, went to a better school or went to a more prestigious. You start, we derive our ability to influence others by who we are as a person. And if you can show me in your heart that you care about me, and what we're doing is important, you've, you've laid out the vision for me, and that you're loyal to me and expect my loyalty back. And if you tell me something that's true, and, and I know if I tell you something, darn it, it better be true, right? Because that's the relationship we have. We derive our ability to influence others by who we are as a person and starts with our values. And here's the problem. By the time someone my age talks to someone most of your age, about values, it's a little late, isn't it? When, when are our values formed? About here, right? Like somewhere around here, maybe here. But And where do we get them? Parents. Right, from, from our parents, from our teachers, from, from the people that surround us in life, right? So, it, you know, I want you to introspect on what my core values are. What are my personal core values? Am I a good person? If I tell you something, is it true? If I tell mom something, is it true? If I tell Joe something, is it true? If I tell Ann something, it's true. Is it different for different people? I want you to reflect and introspect on what your value is, because that's where it starts. Leadership is about influencing others, but it starts with core values. It starts with core values. That's what I want you to reflect on. Who are you as a person? And when you leave here after today, I want you to introspect on who am I as a person and what are my core values. Okay? Any questions on anything I've covered today? I've really enjoyed interacting with you. Thank you very much for having me. around and uh, you guys should continue to talk all this stuff. It's super important. <coughs> hey, thanks for being here. Thanks for coming and listening to me today and give Rob a hand. <laughs>